I am convinced that you are very reverent and very quiet people. There is just no way that you can listen to that story of victory in Christ Jesus and sit on your hands. Huh? Could you not give a celebratory clap for the Lord and the victory that we have in Christ Jesus? I would imagine that a few of you yelled louder than that yesterday at the ball game. Just a few of you. Now, we haven't taken any moment to uh, invite those who have prayer requests to come forward, but we do have a couple that we want to share with you. Um, Darlene's sister is in the hospital in Columbus. We also have Jane Benson on our list of people who are now in the hospital. We want to pray for both of those people. And here's what I'd like you to do. I, I, I know that I watched the choir stand up to many of those people. I wasn't able to see you standing up for that. But I'm sure this morning there are many of you who are holding someone in your hands that all of this has reminded you of, brought you to a place in which your heart says, I miss them. So as we hold up these folks who are in the hospital, can we not also hold before God those faces, those names, those people uh, that we miss, that are no longer with us, but who are having the victory in Christ Jesus currently? Will you pray with me and hold these things in the presence of the Lord? Father, we thank you so very much for the victory we have in Christ Jesus. How we thank you. And how we hold to this hope in the midst of our most difficult hours. Hear us as we once again grieve for those who are missing. We shed a tear for the, for the pain of empty rooms, empty chairs, empty places in our lives. Draw us near to you again and remind us of our hope in Christ Jesus. We invite you to send your spirit to those who are in the hospital and are hurting right now, those who could not be with us this morning. We we invite you to lean heavily upon them that they may walk with you in a renewed spirit this morning. And we pray that as we go forth, we go forth as those who live victoriously in Christ Jesus. For this we pray in your holy name. Amen. I've been asked to remind us that Fran's birthday is today. Hi, Fran. I, I was told it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30. Is that right? 30. So I don't know if you uh, are a football fan or not, but uh, I have set my TV to record all the football games because quite frequently I am not able to watch the games that I want to watch. And yesterday's Ohio State game was one of those. I had to be in Ottawa. I was teaching a class in Ottawa. And uh, so I was not able to watch the ball game and was trusting that I was recording it. Um, but it was getting all these texts from a group of fellows who were obviously watching the game, and they were just as frustrated about how Ohio State was playing, and it was my assumption that we were losing. And uh, so I, uh, I was saying to myself in, in that losing cause, well, I don't care if I taped it then. I ain't going to watch a ball game that we lose. I like watching ball games when I know I'm going to win. I like to know that the outcome of the, and every once in a while I'll watch a tape ball game and I keep asking myself, are we sure we're going to win that game? Because I, I like the celebration 
of victory, and I hate the feeling of defeat. Therefore, I want to know who wins. And if you want to live in my world for just a second, uh, my TV taped Michigan State and not Ohio State. Just, just, just let you know. I, I, sh- I share all this because I want you to grasp, I want you to grasp why I like 1 Corinthians 15 so much. Because Paul tells us we are victorious. Amen? We have received the victory. And when I read 1 Corinthians 15, I know who wins in the end. Therefore, I appreciate in this series of knots that we are doing, why Paul says, you have received the victory in Christ Jesus. Therefore, therefore, he says, stand firm or be strong and steady as it is in your translation in verse 56. Be strong and steady or in the world of our series of knots, do not quit. I want to come from the text for just a second and talk from my heart with you. Because losing someone's hard, isn't it? I've I've never talked to anyone who didn't think losing someone, no matter what their circumstances of their lives were, no matter how badly they were ill or sick, did not feel the pain of having to say goodbye. Would you concur? And do we not begin, as the older we get, to create a list of those who we miss And that list begins to get longer and longer as we live longer and longer. And we begin to we begin to think, I I think I know more people over there than I do here. And in that midst of that pain, what we begin to do is we begin to focus on God as someone who has taken something from us. And in the midst of that frustration that God has taken something from us, we get angry and frustrated with God. Come on, let's be honest. We get angry and frustrated with God that that thing has been taken from us, that person has been taken from us, that that love has been taken from us, that relationship has been taken from us, and that there's a hole in our world, there's a hole in our life because that that has been taken from us. And for many That anger and that frustration with that loss leads to a brokenness in our relationship with God. We no longer have an intimate, passionate, life-changing relationship with God. We have this broken relationship with God where we, we have trouble praying to the God who has done this to us. We have trouble being... In, in the presence of this God who we no longer trust and, 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 and we believe in. We, we, and, and, and for some, some it, 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 it's an entire journey of walking away from God and becoming disconnected with God. I no longer believe in God because I have this great loss in my life. Can I give us a different perspective? And, and one I'm, I'm genuinely sharing from my heart as a difficult journey to really involve my whole life into. But that God didn't take something from us, but gave something to us. Now, watch the shift. And here's what I would suggest to many of us is the difficult journey of grief. Paul, in this 1 Corinthians 15, opens the can of worms that death, death came because of Adam. 
sin brought about death. Adam's name is brought up because of the Genesis story that we have that God created the heavens and the earth, and, 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 and it was good, and it was wonderful, and, and it was perfect. And then the story starts in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, where because Eve was willing to take of the fruit and Adam was willing to eat of the fruit, that sin entered to the world. And with that sin came death, both physical death and spiritual death. And Paul says, because Adam sinned, we all sin, and therefore all of us are subject to death. That's the way it is. We're all going to die. But... But, because Christ Jesus came, because Jesus lived victoriously amongst us as the sinless Savior, because he was willing to die upon the cross as the Lamb of God, because he rose from the dead, we now have a new hope. And that hope is resurrection. That no matter if you die in Christ Jesus, you will live in Christ Jesus eternally. And he makes this argument that if Christ is risen from the dead, he becomes the first. And we then become the fruit that follows that because he has conquered death. We know we shall conquer death. And so emotionally and mentally, in the midst of our grief, we find ourselves shifting from, I have lost something, God has taken something from me, God has wounded me by doing this, to, isn't it, isn't it amazing that God so loved me? Are you following me? That he was willing to die for me that I might have eternal life. And this is what, this is where we begin to shift from our own selfish perspective of grief to the glorious perspective of, hey, what's going on in heaven? And Paul talks about what it means to be the resurrected. Let's get into 1 Corinthians 15. Would you do that with me? And here's what I hope. What I hope this morning is that you're willing to wrestle with your grief in such a way that you're willing to at least entertain the perspective that although you are hurting because someone is lost, someone has left, someone is gone, that in their world, things could not be any better. Father, we pray for that because grief hurts. And many of us hurt. And because of our hurt and our pain, many of us are walking uh, not in an intimate relationship with you, but in a guarded relationship with you, a, a hurt relationship with you. Some of us have turned our back on you and quit. And we pray this morning that those folks who are broken, those folks who are far from you because of grief, will begin to think in terms of what it means to be a people who have not had something taken from them, but something that has been given to them in Christ Jesus. Amen. So Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, did you, did you turn to your Bible, page 890, 890? Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, is dealing with two perspectives. Two perspectives. The first perspective is that there is no resurrection. The second perspective is that 
some people have already received the resurrection. And I'll get into that in just a second. So look at verse 12 on page 890. I, I don't always know if my pages match up with all the Bibles. Verse 12, he says, But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there is no resurrection of the dead? So that's something that's going on in the life of the church. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. People who are saying that don't understand the implication. The implication is if there's no resurrection of the dead for everyone, then there probably was no resurrection of Jesus Christ. And since he says there is no res- if, if that's where you end up going, then, then we're in trouble. If you follow the rest of the passage, so he, he says not because it's in the resurrection of the dead that we know that Jesus was the Son of God. And then if, if Jesus is the Son of God, then we know that the, the, the death of Jesus Christ on the cross was something amazing. It was something great. It was something holy that happened on the cross of Calvary because God allowed himself to die on the cross for our sins, Paul would argue. And, and it's in that that we find our redemption. So if there's no resurrection, then the, then the cross is meaningless, and therefore you and I are still in our sins. And if you and I are still in our sins... We are to be pitied. Not only that, but we're liars because we keep telling the world that Jesus did rise from the dead and that we have this hope. You need to understand that for Paul, everything rises and falls on the resurrection. Everything. And if you right now are a non-believer, if you right now do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've got to wrestle with the resurrection. You have to ask the question, how did that moment in history get changed? Because the testimony of these men that starts the 1 Corinthians 15 passage is that Jesus rose from the dead and all these people got to see him. And and nobody until then was expecting someone to rise from the dead. The Easter story is very clear. Nobody knew that was going to happen. Nobody was anticipating that that was going to happen. But the women went to the tomb to do what? Finish preparing his dead body. And suddenly everything is turned upside down. And in the midst of that turning upside down, these people started proclaiming not that Jesus taught good things, not that Jesus was a good person, they began to teach, we have seen the dead alive in Jesus Christ. And everything in our world is upside down. We're not clear what it means, but we can say this, he who died on the cross is now alive. And it was in that experience, it was in their witness that everything became changed. Again, if, if, if you are not a believer in Christ Jesus, I, I just want to hold that in front of you for a second and invite you to wrestle with how in the world can the whole world be changed by the witness of these people that they saw a resurrection. How in the world can that be possible If there is no resurrection. And if there is a resurrection, you must, uh, sorry, you must wrestle with its implications. Amen? We are all standing before the empty tomb going, whoa, what does that mean? And Paul draws us into the context of what that means for us. Second of all, and I don't want to spend much time with this because it's kind of crazy stuff. But in the world of the Corinthians church, there were those who were saying that they had already received a spiritual renewal of who they were. In other words, they had already received the resurrection that all the spirit could give to them, all the things that God had offered to them, even to those who would die. 
They were already there. And if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll recognize that because of that mentality, a lot of strange things were going on. A lot of people was doing some crazy stuff. <clears throat> there was stuff around what they could eat and what they couldn't eat. There was, there was stuff about how they were handling sex within their marriages, how they were handling sex outside of their marriages. There's a lot of crazy things were going on. And, and, and one of the things that was a part of that craziness was the fact that they were proclaiming certain spiritual gifts were greater than other spiritual gifts. And all of this was going on, and, and Paul, Paul then takes that on. And he, and, and he doesn't take it on uh, head on. He takes it on this way by saying, how are, the res- how are they resurrected? Verse 35. But some may ask, how will the dead be raised? What's it look like? And I don't think that's the question he's answering. I think what he's answering is, you can't have a resurrection body here on earth. And so he has to take that on. But, but the gift in that, and the reason I don't want to spend much time on that, is because in the gift, he talks about what it means to have a resurrected body. And this is so cool. Because this, this is what we believe is going on with our loved ones who have gone ahead of us who have received the victory. This is what we understand. And so he starts with this idea. You got a seed. You you got a seed. That doesn't look like a plant. It looks like a seed. But if you plant it in the ground, look what happens to it. It blooms and blossoms and takes on this other form. It's the same thing. It's the same plant. It's the same essence of the seed. But now it is glorious. And he says, so will be the resurrection. The seed is glorious planted and something beautiful comes from it can you see the implications something beautiful comes out of that seed and it's not the seed itself but it's something amazing it's something gracious it's something wonderful and he gets done with that argument he gets done with that argument and and he and he and he says this well let me tell you this secret then verse 51 not all of us will die but we will all be transformed. All of us. Wait a minute. All of us in Christ Jesus. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. What are we talking about? We're talking about the return of Christ Jesus. Okay? We'll be raised with transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. For our perishable earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. The corrupt, the broken, the wounded body of ours has to give way to the immortal body that is to come. Okay, you look in the mirror and you say, hey, I don't like how that looks. I'm, I'm here to say, when you look into your mirror at heaven, it'll be glorious. How many want to look glorious? Come on, some of you do. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the woundedness of your body, the ouchiness of your body, the, 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 the rheumatoid arthritis of your body, the, the, the hurt in your body. The, the, yeah, come on, I'm getting old enough. I know where you're at. <laughs> you, you, you wake up and you hurt. And yeah, I, I've, I've talked to Mike Snyder about this several times. We just take inventory. What hurts this morning? <laughs> Won't happen. That new transformed body is incorruptible. It will never deteriorate. Come on, some of you want some of your loved ones deteriorate into absolute nothingness because of disease and pain. You think they regret getting a new body? You think they regret not having to deal with the snotties and the, and the allergies and the colds and the flus and the pneumonias that you and I have to get all these shots for? Do you not sense that those old 
tired, worn out bodies got planted as seeds and became resurrected in this new and glorious piece of who they are. You have to know that where they are, they're going, woohoo! And when we read these names of saints, we read these names like, oh my God, there's another one lost. When in heaven they're going, yeah, another one! Yeah, we finally made it. Come on, folks, way down inside, you've got to know that there are people who are going to heaven and there's a cloud of witnesses. That long list of people, that long list of people that they have said goodbye to and they're all there, they're going, yeah, come on, baby, come on home. Because that's the good news. That Christ has gone before us and has established a place for us to be that where he is, we may be also. The glorious good news. We get this resurrected body and get to spend the eternity in the presence of Jesus. Now, not all of us are going to die. One day Jesus is going to come back. But here's the good news. Every one of us get to replace these old shells with the glorious resurrection bodies of Christ Jesus. And we know this because every year we have a date in our calendar. Every year we have a date in our calendar and we call it Easter. And every day we go, Jesus is not in this tomb. He is alive. And so shall we be. You see it? So, so Paul goes off in this argument. He goes, when this happens. You see it in verse 54? When this happens. When our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. Then at last the scriptures will come true. Death has been swallowed up. <laughs> we win. You see it? We win. It is our victory. Death loses. We win. Oh, death, where is your victory? Can you see him going, nah, 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 nah. Okay, and he goes, oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting, right? Adam sinned, therefore sin had its victory in death. But for the, for the sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. How we thank God who gives us victory over sin and death through Christ Jesus our Lord. We win. We win. Sin can't defeat what has already been won for us. Billy Graham's daughter Right, says, I've read this at a dozen funerals. If you've ever seen a funeral, you probably have heard it before. One day, one day, what a glorious day. One day, God Himself will take your face in His hands and gently wipe away your tears as He reassures you that there will be no more suffering in my Father's house. No more pain or hospitals or death or funerals or grief or walkers or canes or wheelchairs. There will be no more, bro more suicide bombers or furia infernos. Broken homes or broken hearts. Broken lives or broken dreams. There will be no more mental retardation or physical handicaps. Muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis. Blindness or lameness. Deafness or sickness. There will be no more Parkinson disease or heart disease. Diabetes or arthritis. Cataracts or paralysis. No more cancer or strokes or AIDS. No more guns in schools or car bombs or terrorists or, terrorists or missiles or airstrikes. No more war. You can look forward with hope because one day there will be no more separation, no more scars, no more suffering in my Father's house. It is the home of your dreams. That is our victory. And I beg you to consider that God has not taken something from you. 
God has not taken something from you. But where we had no hope, God has given to us this great hope. And that your loved one is as, as just celebrating. Come on, celebrating the gift of life. Life in the resurrection where there is no more corruption and no more pain and no more tears. And if we can shift, if we can shift to see it's not something that's been taken from me, but it is something that God has given to me because he has given me this hope. Then I can say to you, you will stand firm in the midst of whatever life throws at you. No matter what goes on, you will stand firm because you know you have this victory. You have this hope. And you will never let go. No matter what. So I say to you who are hurting, I'm going to reassure you how difficult a journey is grief is and how hurtful it is and how every day it seems to come at you when you don't expect it. I can reassure you I understand that. But I ask you to reconsider that grief and see it as not something that God has taken from you, but to celebrate what God has given to you in Christ Jesus. And do not quit. We have an old hymn. Don't you love how these old hymns come to play in our stories? Victory in Jesus. It's page 370. 370. And I know your bulletin says we're supposed to take an offering now, but we're going to wait till we do the hymn to take the offering. If if you're unhappy about that, yell at Jane. I want you to read the first and last verses with me. Uh, This is our story, folks. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wrench like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, and I repented of my sins and won a victory. Look at that last verse. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing in the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there song victory oh victory in Jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him He plunged to me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. He didn't take something from you. He's given this to you. That this morning, we can stand before all the saints and sing with them victory in Jesus. If you don't sing this with all your heart, you have lost something in your soul. Will you stand with me as together we sing? 370. Victory in Jesus.
Yeah, I was going to say, you just going to sit there and not say anything there? I'm telling you, that's better than a last-minute touchdown. Yeah, that's better than a last-minute touchdown. Come on. Give me a shout for the Lord this morning and the victory that he has given to us. Come on. Thank you. Lord. Thank you. We still need to take an offering. If our ushers will come forward, we'll give you just a chance to get your breath, and then we'll close our service if the ushers will come forward. We live in the glorious resurrection, Lord, the glorious promise of victory, and we stand firm, thanking you for all that you have given to us and returning a piece of it to you, that your church might continue to go forth into the world for the kingdom of God. In the name of Christ, we thank you. Amen.